you know, we can backtrack a little bit. Tell me about your fishing DNA. My fishing DNA. I mean, uh, a lot hey. of, you know, the people from the inside world know your story and what happened, you know. I don't really even know my story, though, dude. I don't know a whole lot about my dad, a whole lot about my family stuff. I know my dad was born in uh, uh, Linton, Indiana, and he grew up in uh, West Virginia, but he ran away from home because his uh, crazy southern mother, uh, you know, his name was James Robert Brewer. He went by Jim, but when he was a kid, he went by Jim Bob because that's the way it was. He hated being called Jim Bob, and his mother was a seamstress. His father was a machinist. Um, his mother made his underwear because she's a seamstress, and he hated the way they fit, so he was without underwear forever. He was <laughs> commando free forever. Ball. He's a free baller. <laughs> commando forever. And I, every picture I ever saw from him growing up, he had his hand stuck down the front of his pants, you know, just like in his, in his waistband, just right there. But it's like, man, you know, cool dude, and I don't really even know. His, I know he ended up going to uh, university. First of all, he was an Eagle Scout. Yeah, he, he left home because he didn't want to be where he was, and he made his way through life, and he turned out he, he became an Eagle Scout. I, I had two sashes full of merit badges and a cigar box full of merit badges that he earned as an Eagle Scout. So then he became, uh, let me see, I have, a, I have some paperwork from his wallet that they took off of him after the plane wreck, and uh, he has an aviator card in there. He was an air traffic controller in the Air Force which is where my mother met him in West Point because he was at West Point and, and my mother grew up in, in Newburgh, New York. So she used to go up to see the Air Force guys and hooked up with my dad. So, But then anyway, he came down here and I don't even know how he got here, but I know he went to the University of Miami, got a degree in uh, engineering, but he also worked for the Shakespeare Tackle Company who were headquartered in South Bend, Indiana. No, Charles, no, in South Carolina. I'm, they were in South Carolina. Columbia, I think, in South Carolina. But ever since I can remember, he was getting a paycheck from Shakespeare. He was getting all his tackle, uh, rods, reels. Uh, he was getting boats given to him. He was getting OMC gave him motors. Um, and he was doing films, I think, starting in sometime in the late 50s, you know, through he died in 1975. And, uh, yeah, but anyway, he was doing films before that with, uh, Shakespeare. So I did a Silver Kings show with Jared a couple years ago. And part of the footage that they put in there was footage that of my dad that had to be like eight millimeter or 16 millimeter film back in the day, you know, probably early, early sixties, right. had to be early sixties, maybe even late fifties, you know, and they're and great action shots, whatever, but really cool stuff. So anyway, that's what he was doing. And. So anyway, where did I get all? Uh, he he managed the Shakespeare field test operations. The name of his boat was the Shakespeare Guide. He was the Shakespeare Guide. So he came down here. He, they were giving him tackle and everything. He started the old equalizer, the ugly stick, everything. That all came through him. He started the ugly stick. Well, he was one of the first guys to do shit. Yeah. That's awesome. It was him with Ted Williams, and, and I think that's how it got its name. They're like, I don't know what this rod is, but it sure is ugly. You know, but it, it, it works pretty good, too. Right. But and it, it sure never is broke. ugly. You can it bend never it, broke. It, you can bend it into a figure eight. And that was the ugly stick. And, uh, you know, he was friends with Alf Luger. He was friends with Flip Pallet. He was friends with Lefty. He was friends with Stu. All those guys. Um, and he had a full-time job as a guide. He guided 300 and probably 320 days a year. Every year that I knew him, he was, I mean, here, Army water. Michigan, somewhere. He'd go to Michigan and fish for Chinook salmon up there and, you know, catch him. I did float trips with him down the Manistee River with him and a guy named Dan Lynn, you know, doing stuff, you know. And he used to meticulous notes, meticulous, everything. I, I had a uh, placemat from a restaurant uh, somewhere up in Manistee River where he wrote down on the back of the placemat, Floated the big manistee today with uh, my son Craig and Dan Land and uh, through mostly caught this on these flies, caught this on these flies. Uh, Craig uh, uh, got the in the trees quite a bit, but uh, still managed to do this, whatever, and had a lot of fun. Moon phase, whatever, all that stuff. So he took unbelievable notes. You know, it's interesting. We spoke with uh, Al Fluger just recently, and I asked him about your dad. Mm -hmm. 
And Al said, your father was so devoted and, and so focused on his craft that it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And, and that was an early stage of being that serious about being that successful. Uh, yeah. I mean, incredible. you see that now, but back in the 60s, yeah. Yeah. He was ahead of his time. Incredible, incredible brain. It's like, uh, I'm, I'm so sad that I didn't really get a chance to, you know, learn, learn a lot of that stuff. But I, I remember being out. He had a 23 Seacraft. I got 23 Seacraft parked in my front yard. It's in 1972. Part of the reason I got that. Because your dad had a 23 Seacraft. And that one belonged to Bob Lewis from up the road. Bob Lewis Kite Flyer. I bought it from his kid, Jimmy. You know, uh, I don't know, 10 years ago. I spent five years, no not 10 years ago, 15 years ago, spent five years redoing it. And uh, yeah, I splashed it in 08. The day I splashed the thing, after five years of working on it, outside, under a tent, at my friend Jeff Johnson's house, one year we had five hurricanes come by. So every time a hurricane come, I had to pull the tent down, cover the boat, leave for whatever. But five years later, I finally get the thing. We put it in the water. <laughs> I grab her on the Come on, we're going for a maiden voyage. Uh, my buddy Thane Morgan, who I won the 2010 Gold Cup with, uh, another buddy of mine, Ted Christie, and a couple other buddies of mine are out at Long Key Point waiting for the worm hatch. So I go, let's go. Let's go see what they're doing. Well, I go running down there. I get out offshore. I'm on that outside bar. And uh, we're out there swimming. And we're anchored up. And they're sitting there doing nothing. And all of a sudden, I, it's slick calm. And it's beautiful. Beautiful maiden voyage Maid of the sea craft, which I realized, the okay. stars are in alignment. All of a sudden, I see this cowfish come up off the bottom and go chase down a worm and eat it. And then I see a mangrove snapper come up, chase down a worm and eat it. And I go, Shit, they're worming right here, Rhonda. We're in the middle of a worm hatch, so we're watching the box fish and the snapper come up and eat this stuff. All of a sudden, this like poon starts, and we're swimming in the water. All right, we're in the water swimming, and she's we're swimming around so fun. Get her up on the platform and pull her back up in the boat and going to have another drink. And all of a sudden, she goes, what's that? And I go, well, we look down the beach about 200 yards. And here comes Mr. Hammerhead. He comes in there, chases down a poon, eats him. 100 yards from us. Okay, so the nature, day, I, nature the is day blooming. I splashed the boat, I watched, yes, the worms come off and everything around come and eat them and swim by us. And then the apex predator come in and do his thing. It's like, Phew. And that boat, I think, won the Miami Selfish Tournament, I don't know, 15, 17 times. But so I like old things. It's it's cool. Do you feel like your father was there that night? Uh, I think he's there all the time. Yeah. You know, I have a few tattoos, but the first one I have, I put an eagle over my left shoulder, I think, left or right. And that's, you know, that's kind of him there. But Well, I'll let you yeah, tell the story. So obviously we just started speaking about your DNA, yeah. but I'll bring the audience in, you know, to – where we're at in the fact that your father was a fishing guide here in the Keys and, uh, you know, tragic accident after he won the Gold Cup in 1974. The following year, they're out there looking for tarpon where to fish the next day, the beginning of the, of the Gold Cup. They have a plane crash and your father perishes. And... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Changed my whole world, dude. Changed my whole world, dude. Changed my well, whole world. And then you win the Gold Cup. Why do I have in an 2010? Attitude. Yes, yes. So here's to your father. <laughs> yeah, here's everybody's father. Yeah, man. here's the fathers and sons. You know, they always uh, do the best you can to have a relationship because a lot of us didn't get that opportunity. So take advantage of what you have. And uh, you know, yeah, yeah. But same time, you know, I don't know. It's crazy too because I look just like him. So I have relatives of mine that I haven't seen for years that I see, and they call me Jim, and every, you know. So, but so so if you don't mind, tell us about the accident. What what took place? If you don't mind, uh, the there. accident. You know, uh, there's a guy named Bill Hagley um, who was friends with Flip Pallet and Sandy and a bunch of guys. I think he was friends with George Hommel too from Worldwide Sportsman. But he had a little plane, a little Cessna, single engine with a stall kit on it. You know, slow or uh, low altitude. You know, slow. Curb wing tips, everything for flying low and slow. So looking for poons. Well, looking for fish. Sorry, part of, part of the whole thing was back in the day when all this stuff was going on, or in the time of the early seventies. Carl Navray owned the Chica Lodge, and he also owned Coca Cola, a bottling company. So he had his own helicopter. So he'd be flying in in the helicopter, you know, back and forth all the time. So 
obviously <laughs> they're gonna go they're gonna find over, the fish they're gonna go fly over the bay and see where the fish are and it's you know it just was something that they did a lot of so and uh yeah so bill came down he had a little plane come and i think he actually had flip was supposed to go flying with him that day and then something happened and he couldn't do it so he called my dad and rescheduled my dad and i remember my dad was here and he was making some some gadgets out of some lobster floats, you know, the round floats that go on a lobster, not real big, but, uh, you know, kind of four inch diameter or flat like this. And you wrap them up with, you know, 60 pound or something with a one ounce sinker on them. And I think he was going to go out there and, you know, pitch them places, but to mark, to mark, where to they mark, are. mark where you wanted to go, you know, the next time, but they were out there flying low, flying slow somewhere around by Pelican key. And I think they had a low altitude stall and, went in when both of them both of them perished right there i've never been to the actual site i don't know you know i was only 14 so i didn't i wouldn't spend a lot of time out there then and i never really have been to the site but uh so and it was pretty weird for us for a long time i didn't believe he was gone you know right and even at the funeral they had a closed casket for him down at the uh, matacumbi methodist and i kept thinking and then I had dreams for years after that that, you know, he'd show up after a while and it's just he wasn't, didn't want to be around us. He just, just was somewhere else. He was still alive, but he didn't want to be here. So for me, it was it was pretty tough, but it was also, it made me very angry. But uh, fortunately, I had uh, an old Italian grandmother who lived to be 103 years old and her name was Nicolette and I really love her. And uh, she she wouldn't let me do that shit, you know. Uh, she would get on me with a wooden spoon and say, "No, no, no! You need to, you need to straighten up and get your shit together." Because yeah, what were you gone. doing that she had to straighten you out of? Uh, just acting out, you know. I was pissed. I was you, mad. You I'm fighting? still pissed. You I'm fighting? Still mad. No, I don't fight really. Yeah. No, and you know, I don't know. But you were 14 at the time. Oh yeah, broke my heart, man. Like uh, you couldn't believe, and I still, can. you know, it's part of I don't know. It's part of my whole. DNA makeup everything right you know what and I think and that. that's what I made mention of is like yeah you know all these years later 36 years later you win the gold cup that he had won in in 74 did, yeah. and both your father yeah. and your name is on the gold cup now yeah, yeah. that's the greatest thing ever greatest thing ever to do that yeah that was like phew, huge weight off my back at the same time and that's really all I wanted to do and when I started guiding you know I got into fly fishing pr- pr- pretty much because that's what he did and that's what I wanted to do. And I knew that I didn't want to go take the regular angler. I don't want to go fly fishing, dude. I want to do it. And I can fly fish. I can throw the fly. So, and I'm, after he died, I had access to all kinds of tackle. So I'd go in there and grab one of his old equalizers and get out in the front yard over on North Hammock, which is right here where I still live. I'm on South Hammock, but I own on North Hammock too. But I'd get up there and I'd throw at the garbage can, which was 75 feet away from me. And you'd get out and in the knock the, the lid off of it. Well, I'd get out in the middle of the street and load that thing and. You know, and it's like, whoa, this is this is cool. So, and then once I started, but I caught a lot of fish before that. I mean, right. I, I didn't start guiding until I was 27. I really didn't start even trying to throw a fly rod for a fish until I was 27. But prior to that, I learned how to throw the rod. What were your ear, your early years like? I mean, did, when do you remember first fishing <laughs> with your dad? I mean, he introduced. I didn't you get to a... fish with my dad that much because he was busy. Right. All right. So most of my fishing was. I'd get on my bicycle and I'd ride down either to the gas station and get a bag of frozen shrimp or I'd ride all the way down to Autumn Rod of Tackle and I'd get a, ba- a bucket of live shrimp. But most of the time I didn't even bother. I got a couple bags of frozen shrimp and I'd go right over to the jetty off of uh, Whale Harbor, off of Wahoos right there at Whale Harbor and I'd go around there and sit on those rocks and catch. You wouldn't believe the stuff that I caught there. I mean, what were you catching? Mangrove snappers, yellow tails, groupers, cabara snappers, jack crevels, tarpon, snook, everything, everything. You know, just throwing it out there, watching. And yeah, that's what I do for a lot of time. And then you know, we did a lot of other stuff. I remember I ride down. There was a group, a family that uh, had a place right down on Big Basin, which is the heart of Isla Mirada, between here and the Lorelei, right down behind the uh, uh, Tiny's gas station now on avocado lane there they had a house with a saltwater pool and a boat basin with a beach ramp and a rock jetty that went out and we would go down there and it was like um you know oliver twist and the wild gang or the wild bunch or whatever it was like eight or ten kids from the neighborhood different kids that would all come there every day and they had 
sailboats, they had power boats, they had paddle boats, they had, and we'd fish off the dock, we'd go out and sail around in the sunfish uh, sailboats and play like pirates where you, you get two guys or four guys on two different boats and you go, <laughs> one guy jump over, swim over, pull the rudder out, pull the mast up, dump it over, jump back on the other boat. So, man, we had so much fun. There was nobody here. It's like, uh, you know, growing up in the, in the Keys, so. but I still live in the same neighborhood that I grew up in. Tell me about this house. <laughs> well, first of I all. Mean, I mean, this is very historical. All, I got to tell you, the first seven years of my life, I spent uh, four houses up here in a rental house. Uh, the next uh, 16 or so I spent on a house right over here on North Hammock, which is less than 200 yards away from me that my dad built. And uh, then I, I married my wife, Rhonda, in 1999 and moved into this house, which I've been in since then, which has been sitting here since uh, they moved it over to where it is. Uh, originally the house was built right after the 35 hurricane and uh, i think it was a 37 or 38 38 it was built so um and until 1960 it sat on the beach over on the atlantic side of us1 and then hurricane donna came and blew it up into the highway and so mr russell floyd russell who owned this whole property here from the ocean all the way down to here decided he wanted to move it over here so they picked it up and moved it over and set it on some pilings and it's this is where it's been sitting since then 1961 i guess so and this is where i've been sitting since like 1960 so it's crazy i walk my dogs around the same place where i bled and spit and you know threw up and cried and did everything else for the last 59 years almost 60 i'll be 60 in two days and i've been in amra the whole time so it's like now, I'm just a kid who grew up in the place where, why would you want to be anywhere else? Right. And took advantage of it. and uh, Paradise. You know. Show me your tattoo. Paradise. My tat. I don't, I don't want to miss out on this. Yeah, well. So this is the gold cup. That's my 1974, gold cup that date. So that's your when dad you, won it. That's when your dad won it. 2010 yeah. when you won. Big left, old tarpon. I left a little room down here because I was hoping to do it again like 2020, actually. But <laughs> it didn't happen, but. I got well, room for another one, hey. so, and I'm not done, so I'm still going to keep doing the tournaments. I love that tournament especially, and, you know, a lot of it's because of, yeah. So. But, yeah, it's, it's cool, man. And another cool thing is, yeah, to do it with Thane, that year Thane and I fished 70 days that year. Getting ready. Getting, well, yeah, Training, getting ready practicing. for that. And, boom, it all came together. And, dude, day five of the Gold Cup 2010 was was pretty crazy. All right, and uh, yeah, Thane and Dustin had uh, started their relationship uh, kind of back then, so it was funny because I pull up onto a spot Thursday at a Gold Cup. We were fished there, and it's like we had some good opportunities, but we didn't take advantage of them. And uh, so it's like we go back, and we change flies a couple times, and then we go back to the next day, and I go, no, we're throwing this. All right, we're throwing this fly right here. Don't worry about it. Don't, don't question me. Trust it. it. Trust it. So. We get there and the tide's just getting right, and you know it's perfect, beautiful day. And uh, I, I see a push come down the edge of the bank, and Thane throws out in front of it, and just poof, fish eats it. And I go, "It's a permit." And he goes, "What?" I go, "It's a permit." So catch about a twenty pound permit on the first cast. He said, like, "God damn it!" On a tarpon fly. He's like, <laughs> yeah. So when are you ever cursing? So when are you ever cursing a, a permit? <laughs> no, right. yeah. So we're cursing the permit. <laughs> we're not really cursing it, but it's like, okay, permit. That's pretty yeah, cool. That's okay. So then uh, I think he sent. Uh, he th- sent uh, Dustin a text. Is this, is this good luck or what? He says, dude, wrong species. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're like, yeah, but is that cool or what? So right, about 15 minutes later, I see another push come down the bank. He throws out in front of it. Fish misses it, swings around. He throws out in front of it again. Eats like, oh, that's another permit. He goes, oh, what? Right, yeah, another permit. You know, like a 15-pounder. I'm like, Shh. And you caught it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah Two so, permit. Two permit. And we're sitting there and we start the gold know, cup lines in at seven o'clock. Yeah. We're in the gold cup and we're looking for a tarpon and we ain't seen a tarpon yet, but we just caught two permit on fly. <laughs> shit. You could have won the <laughs> Holly. And we're like, we're like, Oh shit, man. And so he said, shit. no, the Del Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Del Brown. Is this any good? Is this any good? Well, dude, wrong species, you know? <laughs> so anyway, we went on, we went on that day to catch uh, five tarpon in the same spot before noon. Um, one of them we thought might have been a weight fish it was close and we were going to strap him, but we decided not to. We let him go for the release. So we were fishing against Flutie and Siska, on, you know, who were ahead of us, I think, by 100 points on day, going into day five. And so we caught two permit, five tarpon. It's noon, 
and the tide quit and they, they quit swimming where we were so i left and went to another spot fish comes down the edge we throw out from she comes up and eats cook her about 120 pounder nice couple jumps out of her gone i go i got a feeling that just cost us a tournament he's like oh, okay really so we already caught five tarpon already but but we lost that one and then our day was nothing after that but we came in flutie and Siska hadn't caught anything so we're like all right two permit five tarpon last day to golf cup we get biggest we get most points we get most releases we took everything 2010 and it was like pfft. meant to be it was yeah and how was nervous it. were you as the guide knowing that if you win this your name is, is going to be among your you know on the trophy with, with the not at all my name's already thinking. out there for lots of reasons no i don't no, i'm proud of some no of them not no but no i get that but oh, on but, the trophy but this is on the trophy ah dude no i sat at the, i was sitting over at the bar and that that year they had gotten away from the big banquets with the suit and tie and it was on the beach at the lorelei which is fitting for me you know I don't care. Billy Knowles, one of my best buddies, was in the hospital, and uh, I donated the tournament win to him, and uh, we got our trophy out on the sand or whatever. But I was sitting at the bar. I remember waiting for Flutie and Siska because they were fishing the Cape around the right. corner. So we're in already. We're waiting, and, I'm, you know, we caught five tarpon that day, and I'm still going. I don't know if that was enough because you just don't know. You know, Not till the buzzer. When you're catching, you think somebody else is catching. You know, you and I have experienced that before, yeah. and I will talk about that Out before too long. <laughs> yeah. ah, that was crazy, but you know, so yeah, it was. I was really nervous, and then um, one of my buddies, Baker Baker Bishop, came over, and uh, you know, he smacked me on the shoulder and said, "You did it, man!" And I just started crying. So, you know, it's like, so it is. You know, one of those things. Yeah, and uh, my buddy Rob Fordyce, you know, he says you're a big dog now. You know, so being that was good because I've been there and I've won bonefish tournaments. Uh, I never won the Holly. I've won the ladies, you know, won the gold cup once, you know, I've been a contender, but never really. And part of it is, you know, I don't really have that killer instinct. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to play the game. I want to be there, but I'm not. So if I don't win, I, I'm not going to be able to survive. So then I don't strive that hard to be, I'm not the apex predator. Right. You know, I like to play the game, but I fished with people. I've had some fabulous fishing, but a lot of years I fished the gold cup with a guy named Walter Sullivan. So when Flutie was going through his five years of winning, you know, and one year he, he won the thing with Harry and I, I talked to him one day, I go, Glenn, how many fish uh, did you hook in that tournament? He said, we hooked 14, caught 10. <laughs> right. Like, you we, can't compete with that. We went four for 38. <laughs> All right. Four for 38, because right. that's the way, but you know, so you're there, but if you, yeah, so a lot of things are going on. So I love being it. So when everything comes together and you know, when it's going to be your turn, because on Monday, you know, when you hook that first fish, and it runs out here and does a bunch of crazy stuff you've never seen happen before, and you lose it. It's like, you know. Right. But I love tournaments because the highs are so high and the lows are so low, and you know I love it though. So. But how point. how much of a confirmation was it for you to actually win the Gold Cup, which is the Holy Grail in the in the in the Florida Keys? <sighs> Not as much as a guide as it would have been if I'd have done it as an angler. I don't think so. Why do you say that? Yeah, because, man, I'd rather be on the bow. There's no doubt about it. I'd rather I, be on the bow. I, look, yeah, but 15 feet forward or 15 or 16 uh, feet backward, uh, it's still a fucking great win. I mean, it's uh, the biggest tournament. No, it is. It is. And it in was, tarpon fishing. It was a spectacular year, and I, I, I love the fact I did it with who I did it with. And, uh, you know, we learned a lot that year, and it was, yeah. And uh, it was, everything just came together for us that time. But, uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't really doubt that it was ever going to happen. I knew it was going to happen sometime. I just wasn't sure when exactly. But it's right. funny because I fished it the first year I started fishing. I fished the Gold Cup. You know, first year I started fishing, I ended up in the Holly. And it's like, you know, all right, here we go. We're, 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 we're fishing now. So, but pretty funny. I can tell you a couple of stories about both of those too. But, you know, uh, yeah. go there. I started fishing in 1987. Uh, Timmy, Timmy Klein and I used to spend a lot of time fishing together. I mean, we hung out a lot. We fished together a lot. We were like, he pulled me. You all went to high school together, right? Uh, I'm not sure how much high school he went to, but, (laughs) (laughs) but yeah, you were enrolled. (laughs) Well, no, we hung out and his, you know, our families were friends. His dad and my dad were friends and we were friends and I was friended for a long time, but he and I were, yeah, great friends for a long time. We're still good friends, but we just don't spend as much time as you, but, 
there was a time when we were every day we're going fishing what are you doing we're going fishing and we would go fishing and be like you know i'd be on the bow and you know i mostly time we were catching uh, redfish you know throwing jigs at redfish when i was a kid growing up here dude our red fishery was unbelievable i mean way different than it is now you could be running across 40 acres and you'd see a big push raise up and you'd go run alongside them and throw two flathead jigs out. And before your boat was even off a plane, you'd be hooked up to two 12 to 15 pound, beautiful gold red fish. And, and it'd be a school of 300, you know, and after you caught them, you catch a couple more. And if you didn't see the school anymore, you crank up and jump up in a little pothole in your little 16 footer with a 40 on it and go run around and you see the wakes and you go, but, or you get up on the flats and you see them tailing everywhere. So, and, made me a good fisherman because i'd be on the bow and if i threw my jig and didn't hook the thing there was one coming over my head which yeah. was going to be there <laughs> yes, so right. and the same thing when he was on the bow we did the same thing so a lot of it was competition i let him throw and then i'd be right behind him and boom i'd snag the fish for he, or whatever but so it's fun so anyway made us both good anglers but i was fishing all the time that's i loved fishing yeah what uh, i wanted to do. you know you lost your father at 14 you were in the yeah. abyss you were lost who became a mentor if you had one at that age? I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I had one at that age. I'd have to think about that. Actually, who, I did have who, several people. Actually, Billy they, Knowles? No, not really. You who, know, who inspired you to? Uh, you know, I got to give a shout out to a guy named Jerry Bowman. Um, who ended, ended up? He's a guy. I'm not even sure where he came from, man. New Jersey, somewhere. I know his brother was uh, chief of police. His father was uh, an investigator. He used to uh, be able to, you know, look at uh, uh, fingerprints and match fingerprints before there was a big database and everything. He was one of the top guys that uh, he could eyeball match and, it. No, he mag, but he yeah he read those and he was a really cool old dude. And Jerry, Jerry was kind of a swinger, but I think he was like a, maybe a dealer in Vegas. What do you mean by swinger? He was a dealer in Vegas. And a bunch of <laughs> well, but then he was dating my mom. He was dating my mom. So. But think of it. Back in like, okay, this is probably um, late 70s. Yeah, late 70s. Because I graduated high school in 78. So it's probably, yeah, late 70s. And he was living uh, on top of the grocery store down in Layton in the apartment up there. And he was a commercial lobster fisherman. And a uh, really cool guy. But that's... That's not where he came from. That's where right. he ended up. So um, he was really suave and really smart guy. He put me to work. I started working like uh, he had 1,100 lobster traps. So I left uh, my junior year at Coral Shores. I played on the football team. I was a pulling guard. Uh, at the end of my junior year, I weighed 135 pounds. The pulling guard. I'm pulling guard going down the line and You're taking in out trouble. the dang guy. 135 pounds. Yeah, I'm uh, 16 years old uh six one 135 pounds um and then yeah i went to work for him for the summer and we worked 1100 traps i put on 35 pounds of muscle over that summer uh while we were working traps and stuff went back to start spring training as a senior weighing 170 and uh yeah i didn't quit growing until i was 23 so yeah now i weigh 230 i'm 6'3 i used to be 6'4 but i'm smaller now let me see how long your fingers are they're not any longer than yours <laughs> this is no, you're longer than yours. You got big hands. But yeah, I got big hands. I got skinny wrists. So, but people, I'm, yeah, it's pretty fun. It's kind of awkward. But, but anyways, <laughs> anyways, that's that. But, you know, so yeah, you know, I, I grew up here and but Jerry was a cool guy and he taught me some cool stuff. We used to go play darts at uh, Rum Runners for Rum Runners. And he taught me how to play darts and we drank a lot of Rum Runners. And we did a lot of stuff and, you know, I learned work ethic and I've always been a hard worker. I'm not the smartest guy, but, you know, I was pretty physical. I could do anything, so I wasn't real worried about it. But anyway, so, uh, and after that, uh, yes. So he was like a father figure, if you will. He was, kind to, of. To, he to, was to bridge kind of. the gap. Yeah, and then he disappeared, but there was so much other stuff going on back then. It was the day of disco, and there was clubs all over the place. There was girls everywhere, so drinking age was 18. I was drinking since I was 15. So, you know, we were, I was running around like a wild man. I didn't really care. You know, my friends, my friends were my friends. And yeah, he happened to be somebody that I respected and, you know, whatever. But uh, okay. And then, yeah. But what what about in the fishing world? In the Anyone? fishing world? Wait, 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 wait. wait. Let's back up a little, a little bit. Do you want to get to the fishing no, no, wait, world? Let's get back up. Bloodline. 
we were talking about that generation, disco, every, every, the, the keys were going off. There were obviously a lot of square groupers mm-hmm. being run back and forth. How accurate was, was the series Bloodline? You know, well, with, with the keys and the and the drug running. I'm not and... ready for any more of that. I'll <laughs> tell you the truth. Uh, Rhonda and I, which is a whole other story I could talk about, Rhonda and I, which is pretty crazy. But, um, yeah, Bloodlines, I think we watched uh, the first three episodes, and I couldn't watch anymore. And I just quit watching it. Everybody's like, oh, it gets better after the fifth episode or whatever. And it's like, I don't care. I, I don't care. I quit watching it. It just it didn't entertain me at all. So I don't even know what the storyline was because after the first couple, it was so slow. And it's, you know, I live life here. I won't tell you the things that I did because I just, most of them I don't remember. And a lot of my, uh, yeah, spent a lot of time uh, working on forgetting about. So, you know, you know, whatever. But I don't really know. Well, you survived. Yeah, I've survived. But, I've been a survivor, and I don't really know how in depth, you know, bloodlines got. Did that get into like uh, uh, people trafficking and stuff like yeah. that? Because if yeah. it did, I don't it know. was more drug trafficking and I never know, trafficked and, into. There Anyways, was, you know, yeah, there was a lot of drugs, dude. There was a lot of drug trafficking going on here. It was crazy. I mean, the people had police scanners, and there'd be like three or four things going off at night, you know, and it'd be like running around. And sh- I knew people. I knew people that would get in their boat with a blue light and go chasing people around and get them to throw their load off and then they'd steal it and take off with it. So, you know, but I can't, I that can't, was, a, that was, a, that was kind of like, I can't testify to that in person because I really can't prove it. And, but you know, right. no, but there was crazy shit going was on here. Crazy shit going on. There's, I'm sure there still is. And before that, there was crazier stuff going on before that. I mean, you know, you're in the Florida Keys. Cuba's right there. The Bahamas are right there. Surrounded by water. Crazy. It's just crazy. So, yeah, I'm glad I survived it because I have a lot of friends that didn't survive it. And I have a lot of friends who spent uh, between 28 months and, you know, 10 years. I have a friend just got out after 31, 31 years in for doing that stuff. And he finally got out. And I cannot believe, I cannot believe talking to him you never would know he just spent 31 years in a federal penitentiary man the guy is sharp he's on the ball he's, but that's why so many people petitioned to get him out in the first place because he was just not where he should have been but you know well too there were there were a lot of guys that spent a lot of time for marijuana well, you know uh, running and it's legal now yeah so. yeah and a lot of it's you know, just i don't know just i don't even like talking about that because yeah. i have to really cool really good friends really people that have huge hearts and are down to earth and would give me their shirt off their back that spent time in jail for something that they did which they really shouldn't spend time in right. jail with. so so what about in the fishing world fishing was, was, world, there, was there a mentor or was definitely it, was it- i mean uh you know tim klein got his license in 86 and uh he and i went out on his first uh recon trip to get his first trip we had a spot over Will harbor you know where they hang the, the nail racks and everything so we went out to the back in this little skiff and we caught a bunch of red fish stuff we came back and we stuck them up on the pins and- so that was the way to get charged you put dead so fish up couple- on, on a nail Yes, so this older elderly couple comes walking by, and they said, hey, we we like to catch some redfish. Can you take us fishing tomorrow? And Tim's like, sure. So that's like his first charter. And they ended up fishing with him every September for the next 10 years, I think, for at least four or five days. I went out and got my license the very next year and started guiding, and it was like at the Lorelei, the Amirati Yacht Basin, which is where my dad fished out of for his whole career pretty much, uh, next to Eddie Whiteman and a few other guys, but Billy Knowles and Hank Brown fished out of there so um those guys were friends of my dad so when i started guiding i went in there tim was in there we used to park our boats there so we actually had slips designated where we'd tie up and that was my spot was right there in the basin in front of lorelei and tim was right behind me billy and hank had their spots and it's like roy crabtree who became dr roy crabtree who did all the studies for tarpon right. doing the otoliths and all that stuff so he was there um I don't even know who else was out there, but there was Davy Wilson was out there and a bunch of guys. So they started throwing me charters. And next thing you know, I'm doing, you know, 250, 280 days a year. And this is when you're 27. Yeah. No, 29 probably. 29. It took me a couple of years to get it going. But yeah, after that, I quit doing everything else I was doing to try to make a living. And I was fishing full time. Full time. Yeah. That's probably about 89, probably. Yes. And that, and that was yeah, it was unreal man it was just so what, much what, so what much. was the fishing like oh dude unbelievable it was unbelievable 
I mean, really, there was nothing I'd rather be doing. And it's like, even on my day off, it's like, what are you doing today? I'm, I'm going fishing. So either I'm taking somebody that's going to pay me or I'm going to get a buddy of mine or I'm going fishing by myself because it, it was unbelievable. The snook fishing wasn't that great. Snook have always been kind of up and down, but the red fishing was great. The bone fishing was phenomenal, dude. I yeah, mean, you're, ta- you're talking to someone who's who's been doing it for 13 years. So I've only seen it for the last 13 years. So when you say sorry. unbelievable. No, no, sorry, no, no, dude. no, no. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I understand. No, I'm sorry for real because yeah. you don't have a clue what was here before. I don't think. Did you right. ever see big bone fish in Alamorada? I've never bone fished in Alamorada. Oh, dude. So, so tell me about that. Get some tissue because I'm going to cry. It was unbelievable, dude. Unbelievable. I didn't even fish for them for a long time because they were so difficult for me to to catch that we who wants to mess with those guys, you know? Plus, I didn't want to be in the way of anybody. When I started guiding here, you know, we didn't have GPSs. We didn't have a lot of stuff. And, uh, um, you know, I'd run out towards Nine Mile Bank, and I'd see a couple of guys there, and it'd be like slick common. I really couldn't tell where I was or anything. So I'd just turn around and go a different way because, you know, I knew that whoever it was that was there was somebody that I didn't want to get in was the important. way. Was important. Uh, and then when I started learning some things about it, you know, I, if you're smart enough to know where the fish are, they, they were in a pattern. I wasn't smart enough to know the pattern. I just knew that if I yeah, got on a bank it. and I liked the pole, I would pole for miles. You have work ethic, like you said. I'm going to gonna... find them. I'm going to find them somewhere. And sometimes it's just first bank you hit, you find them, and you find them until you're ready to go home. And they're not just little bonefish that you can barely see in the water. They're 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, four biggest one I've ever seen caught off my boat that I know of because it was a world 15, record. 15, four. World record on 12 pound. A guy named Eddie Miller caught it in a tournament, probably in like 04. I'll have to look at that though. It might have been even in the 90s. But anyway, we caught it one day. Let me tell you about this. Okay, this is a, I think it's a spring fly, spring fly bonefish tournament. I'm fishing with Eddie Miller. Uh, the second day, I think uh, Tim Mahaffey's fishing with Mark Croker. They catch a 14-4. Right. Which on, was a, new, uh, a world record at the time. Well, it would have been. But the very next day, we go out and we catch a nut. We catch a fish. And I put him in the net. And I go, holy shit, this is a big fish. And my guy, Eddie, he said, how big is he? I said, I don't know, but he's bigger than the one that boys caught yesterday. And... uh so I was fishing some Orvis 13.2 pound tippet. So we caught this fish and we put it in for a world record under the 16 pound. So when we did that, Croca and Mahaffey said, well, we're not even going to put ours in because they're going to beat us by a pound right there. So they saw that ours tested under 12. So they gave us the 12 pound record. And so we got the 12 pound record and they didn't ever try to qualify their 16 pound record so it would never went into the books at the 16 pound record but it would have been had they just put it in there but yeah so they catch a 14-4 on tuesday we catch a 15-4 on wednesday i think we caught an 11 pounder and a couple of releases that we didn't even place in that tournament oh okay that tells you that tells you who won, who won that year i think mahaffey and croca but they had the 14-4, probably a 13-6. Yeah, and three twelves. And I used to fish yeah. with my buddy Rick Moeller, God rest his soul. He was he taught me a lot about bone fishing. All right, we'd do the all tackles. And he said, Craig, I don't have enough money to pay you your fee, but I'll pay you for the Calcutta. And if we win, then you I'll, get it. I'll pay you. And I go, dude, we're there. So And we fished it, and we won it several times. And no one, shit. Oh, yeah. yeah. One, year, one year, we were letting go 11-pounders. Because we knew that there was a point break when you got the 12 pounds and right. it was like two and a half points per ounce instead sure. of two points per ounce. So we're letting go 11 pounders trying to catch the 12 pounder. All right. And we, so we did it. And you're only allowed five weight fish for the week. So I think our, our weight fish total ended up being like 58 pounds. Our, our five weight fish together weighed 58 pounds. It's and insane. The fish that we caught, the three fish that we caught after we caught our fifth weight fish, one of them was 13.6, another one was 13.8, and another one was like 13.2. And we couldn't even count them. We had to count them as releases. You already maxed out with your weights. We already caught our five weights. So, but that's what we used to, It was, dude. And when you, yeah, when you, uh, yeah. Yeah, very cool. So, 
the fishing here was great. I used to run the nine mile bank from the lower lie. I'd shut down in the morning in September and I would not start the boat up again until I was ready to run home. And there you'd either find uh, schools of pushing fish, you know, just waking, coming down, or you'd find tailors if the tide was right, or you'd find them mudding off the edge. But they were there, and you you could run there in the morning, shut your motor off, and fish for eight hours, and crank up, and then run home, and never be out of them. And they're just zillions and thousands, whatever, bonefish everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere you went, there was bonefish. What about the tarpon fishing? What, what? <laughs> who cares no 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 the tarpon so, so, fishing no, no, let's dude, go back you let's go back to that so you, you the prefer- tarpon fish it was unbelievable florida bay was alive you know and but did, but did you prefer to bonefish back then no no it was kind of like not a seasonal really. thing you no know? but part of it was like in may part, well part of it was you get up in the morning and it'd still be a little chilly you know, you might get a little bit of north breeze, you know, so or whatever. So you go bone fish for a couple hours, and you boom, you bang them up, and all of a sudden it's slick off, get a little warm, bloop bloop. Let's go poon. So a big part of your day was mixing it up. You were always mixing it up. I mean, you didn't just go tarpon fishing because you couldn't, because you'd be out in one of the lakes, and all of a sudden you'd see them pushing the edge. And I know guys, they sit on the first point of nine mile waiting for a tarpon to come by, and here it come a school of three hundred bonefish. I'd throw my tarpon fly out in front of them and catch one of them. That's unbelievable. No one's ever said that. Oh, it was retarded, dude. I mean, it was like, it was so easy. So it wasn't like, oh, I want to go tarpon fishing. Take me tarpon fishing. It was like, let's go fishing. No, let's go fishing. And let's see what we can catch. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was that good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. For sure it was that good. It was, I mean, and... And you didn't have to try it. I mean, I worked hard, but you didn't really have to be smart and know secret spots. And it's like, dude, and there wasn't hardly anybody else out there. I mean, people were afraid to go into the Florida Bay. They were afraid to go there. I thought they're going to get lost because, you know, this is before GPS. We learned on a paper chart, man, and a compass and a push pole. And you get out there and you learn a little bit and then you learn a little bit more and you push a little bit more. And everybody's like, well, how do you know all this stuff? It's like, because I pulled. I pulled every foot of it. I pulled every edge. I pulled every rim. I pulled, you know, I know what lakes to avoid because they're deep and whatever. But yeah. And yeah. So, so, so how often so. did you explore? Like if you had a client when you're first starting out, yeah. would you go and explore a new area? Or would uh, you do that exploring in that? Some, sometimes, but my new area was pretty small, dude. And uh, I'm, I'm paying for that now. I'm actually paying for that now, you know. It's like, why do I want to go to Biscayne Bay to kind of catch a bonefish, you know, for the first 20 years that I fished? Uh, the first 10 years I guided as a skiff guide, I didn't fish the ocean side for tarpon. It's like, why, why do I want to go out there? When you can catch them back when there. You, oh, and it's like, what do you want? You want babies? You want midsize? You want big ones? What do you want? You and want fish that up? are going to bite. Oh, dude, it was... It, Andy, it was unbelievable back there, man. From Sandy Key around, you know, up in the Hanks Honey Hole right there at Manowar Channel, coming around to the third point of nine mile, second point of nine mile, first point of nine mile, Rabbit Key Basin, you know, Sid, all that stuff. There were so many fish out there. It's like, you know, you could go sit on the third point of nine mile on an incoming tide and it'd be like, all right, they're going to come right here. Here's. I remember Billy and Hank sitting there, and they, Billy Hank would run around to the <laughs> other side. And when the tide would start falling there, some of those fish would come up off Manowar Channel, the pipe channel, which is where my dad's ashes were spread and where my wife and I got married and where several of my dog's ashes had been spread right there at the pipe channel off Manowar. Those fish would come across there, push down Nine Mile Bank, and they'd encounter a falling current. But they'd turn up this false channel, and they'd buck the current for a little bit, and they'd roll a couple times and let you know they're there. And they go, you know, we don't want to work that hard. And then they'd fall off that with the current, and they'd come around the end of this other channel, which is fall, and they'd hit this little bump, and they'd turn and come, and you put the fly right there and let it swing in front of them. Every time. You think Craig knows that spot? Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> and I've caught a bunch of fish here, but Hank used to run over there, and he'd sit there, and then he'd say, Billy, Billy, be over by the stake on the third point proper. He'd say, you got eight coming. He got 10 cut, <laughs> and I sit behind him and I'd hear him on the radio and it'd be like, whoosh, you know, but it was, it was unbelievable, dude. So this spot was one of your father's favorite spots? The pipe channel. Yeah. Off, uh, you know, yeah. Off Manor, Southeast of Manor, I guess coming into Rabbit Key Basin. It's all those fish coming off Oxfoot and Schooner and, uh, Sandy Key, you know, moving their way into Rabbit Key Basin. He fished there a lot. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, a lot. Are, too. Do you have any stories about uh, the pocket? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> let's hear your best one. Oh, the pocket. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I fished with a guy. I think I told you about a guy that I, the first year I started guiding, I fished with a guy. I met a guy, actually, Jack Brothers, who is an old time guy, one of my favorite guys, actually. He called me up and said, Hey, you need to come down to Papa Joe's. I got a guy here from England that uh, wants to fish the Holly tournament. And he's a guide. I'm like, Okay. So I go down there and I meet this guy who ended up being a very good friend of mine for a long time, actually, until 9 11. But, uh, uh, a good friend of mine, his name was Frank Palomara, and he was an American guy, but he was living over in Europe, and he's, you know, big guy, kind of clumsy, whatever, so, and he told me, yeah, I want to, I want to fish the tournament, I'm like, okay, well, I'm open, so let's go, and this was the night before the tournament, so it's like, tomorrow, he says, I've never caught a tarpon on fly, and I've oh never, my God. And I've never and, thrown a one-handed fly rod. And this is the beauty of you, you are a man uh, that yeah. is so generous and let's heart go, giving. Dude. You're a yes man. <laughs> no, so, let's go, man. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Gonna no, be fun. No, but 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 Tahara told me, you know, Paul, you're Paul Tahara. Paul Tahara told me <laughs> we love Paul, obviously. Mm. He said your greatest uh asset is the fact that you've got the greatest heart in the world in that you 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 you, you cheer for others. And if somebody's leading a tournament and you know where they're fishing, you're not going to go there. Ah, you're, you're not going to prevent that. them from winning because you want to catch a fish. You can't do that. You're the most honest person. Ethical. Both. It's the same thing. Yeah. That I've been, Billy I've been, Knowles. I've been called a every, neighbor. I mean, the mayor or whatever. But yeah, that's how I feel about it, dude. And there's people ask me all the time. He says, what is, what is etiquette here? And I go, well, you know, don't do anything to somebody that you wouldn't want them to do to you. Right? And then you will have a problem. And if there's a question, then don't even go there. So, but it's just, that's gone now, man. That's a whole, but I learned when I learned, there was a reason for that. Okay. Because when I learned, there wasn't a lot of young guys coming up. There was a bunch of old crotchety dudes here and you didn't want to cut them off and you didn't want to run over their fish. Cause if you did, you'd hear about it. But right. fortunately, I just give you a heads up on that. I, I, I had my first skiff I got, uh, I had a shy poke. I went up and my bit guy that built him was Fred Archibald and he's a really good friend of my pops. And uh, he built me a boat. But anyway, I came back, and I was in Rabbit Key Basin one day, running along, and I saw a bunch of fish, and I just came back from home with Sass. I had fished up there with Billy Pate's girlfriend, and we would caught a bunch of fish. But I had my double electrics rigged on the back of the boat. And I go in Rabbit Key Basin, I see a school of fish. I shut down, I drop my electrics, and I start motoring around. And we're just looking at them. We're not even fishing for them. So, and then... I don't know. I did some other stuff. I ran out towards Sandy Key. Come back to the lower line. I see Billy Knowles. He goes, uh, as son. As soon as I get in, he goes, son, we got a little problem. And I go, what's that? What's that, old man? He says, uh, Cecil said he don't want you running your electrics in Rabbit Key Basin. I'm like, no problem. I'm not going to run my electrics in Rabbit Key Basin. And that's all there was to that. And it's like, no questions asked about that. But yeah, back. But that's, you know, unfortunately it's a different world now and there's a lot more people trying to fish unfortunately in, in even smaller fishery and that's what really starts to bother me now if it hadn't been for covid this year i i, I can only imagine what the ocean side of isla Mirada and all the way down the florida keys would have looked like with skiffs if we haven't had the covid scare and i know eventually the covid scare added more people here because they're quarantining or whatever and getting away from their daily thing and getting in their skiff and where else would you want to be but you know down here, here. And I'm afraid if it hadn't been for COVID this year and, and next year, I'm really worried about what's going to happen. Because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the places where we're fishing for fish, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to get on shoreline or some of that that's unincorporated, key. that's why the is so popular. Because there's not a bunch of boats coming in now. They're running over your line. But eventually that stuff's going to go away. And I'm going to be in my 23 sea craft out in 12 or 15 feet of water in Hawks Channel throwing that school of fish coming down the road to catch them, I'm afraid. Deeper, deeper so, water. Yeah, so you're thinking years from now, they're not going to go in... Not too at, many years. Not too many years. They're gonna not, not going to swim many. as shallow, and they're going to go in deeper water, and it's going to be a lot tougher. You're seeing it, dude. Nine Mile Bank. Nine Mile Bank in my heyday was unbelievable. You go out there to the first point on incoming tide and pick a spot, there'd be two or three boats in front of you, and your whole time you got schools of fish pushing at you, and as soon as the tide would stop and start falling, you'd just start pulling out there and it'd be laid up as far as you could see. 
and all of a sudden, basin, yeah. all of a sudden, they're not there anymore. They've changed their pattern. Now they're in coming in Rabbit Key Basin and they're busting it in over towards Twin Lake and doing some other stuff. And you th- you think that's from pressure? Oh, definitely, hundred percent, definitely, definitely. And now I think it's even going to get worse because uh, with the bay boat industry kicking up, you know, a lot of those guys they're running out to Sprigger and going out into the Gulf and fishing those six or seven miles off Sprigger and Schooner, and they're running over those same fish. And I know talking to Jerry Alt and a few other guys that they're tagging the fish, they said the fish are still going by, but half the time they're coming off the Cape. They take a little left turn towards Flamingo. They smell the water there or something. They turn and leave, and they go straight down to, like, shark. You no know? shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then they turn around, and they go straight back to uh, to over there where Tommy Locke fishes. You know, Boca Grand. He yeah. says they've tagged fish. They know they do that. They come down the shoreline. They go past nine mile a little bit, and they kick off. They go right down there. They turn around and go right back. And with all the boat traffic running the intercoastal now, running them over, all the guys that are out there bait fishing, oxfoot and schooner, they're going to push them off. They're going to get them out of here. So it's going to make it really hard for us to, as fly guys, to fish them. So how, how do you feel about that? I don't feel good about it, but, you know, that's why I, I – that's why I'm not trying to fish 300 days a year or 280 days a year right now. You know, it, so, you know. Do you still love it more than ever? I don't, I don't love it like I used to. I mean, I still love fishing. I, you know, I don't know. My favorite fishing now is September for a couple of days when I go to Chuck Lusky and get on Bow Huff's boat and he pulls me around. And just get away and from people. that's like my, my favorite time to fish. Tell you me know? about Steve Huff and what oh, kind of dude. an influence he's been to this whole world of ours. Next to you, he's probably my second favorite man in the world. Anyway. Next to me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, Next. let's have another pop of Pilar right now. Ah, oh, dude. No, but you're the same. You're the same kind of guys, you know? And you mentioned my buddy Paul, you know? Paul, I've known him forever. And he's like, yeah, he's like a, a brother from another mother. And Steve is just... Uh, you know, Steve's... He's a godsend. Steve, I've known him for a long time. You know, I was pr- I was really lucky that, uh, you know, my, my dad's name put me in a position um, to be around some really cool people. You know, I'm a brewer, so... Uh, and I don't know. I, I knew Flip when, shoot, I was five or six. He was coming over to my dad's house, so... But, but did Flip find your father? Uh, I don't think he did. Because Flip told me that your mom called me once it got dark. Called him? Called him. Called yeah, him. yeah, yeah. Called yeah. Flip once it got dark that your dad and the plane was not back. Yeah. And he 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 told me after our podcast, once the cameras you know were, were done rolling, he said, I knew exactly where that plane was. Uh, he probably did, but I and don't he know. ran out and he found your dad. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I wouldn't be surprised. I don't remember a whole lot about that time. You're because, fourteen. Ah, was, yeah, man, it was it was pretty crazy. And I remember he was gone and whatever, and it was a really crazy time. So um, yeah, and I heard different stories, but uh, you know, I really don't know if he found them or I talked to a guy from the Coast Guard that supposedly went and pulled him out of the plane. But I don't know that he found him. But I wouldn't be surprised at all that Flip found him, you right. know, because Flip did probably know exactly where the plane was going to be because he had talked to Bill, who was a friend of his. He talked to my dad, you know, and they were like pretty tight. They knew where they were looking for the fish. And I heard a story back, I don't know, we're in the early 70s where Flip was doing a movie or something, doing a shoot, and he was running around down off Key West somewhere, and he came back to his crew, and he says, I got the place, man. I was out there yesterday. There was nobody around, and there was a ton of fish ton of fish everywhere, nobody there. So they get the crew together, they go running out there, and they're all, you know, getting ready to set up, and they see a boat out on the horizon. One dude out there by himself. They run over there, and it's my old man. And it's like, you know, he ended up right in the middle. And I got a card on my nightstand in there, Jim Brewer, light tackle specialist, anywhere in the Florida Keys. Okay, so even then, he was fishing. Everywhere. Miami to, Yeah. That's impressive. Marquesa, Marquesa. And everything. And yeah. And I remember they used to go down to Sugarloaf and hang out there. And actually, he used to guide out of Indies Inn forever on Duck Key. Actually, he was a comptroller there. My mother was working the switchboard in 1960 when Hurricane Donna hit. She was eight months pregnant with me, and we, she spent the night in the top of the hotel there uh, pregnant with me. And Donna came and blew out the highway or whatever. They went up to Miami, so I was born in Miami. But uh, otherwise, I'd have been born right here. So, 
named after the guy that Craig Key was named after, by the way, because they were friends <laughs> with my parents. So, And then there was an old guy named Cecil Keith Sr. Uh, fishing out of there on a boat called the Sea Louise, and his wife was uh, Louise, and that happened to be my wife's grandmother. Really? Yes. Yeah, so when I met my wife, I found out that, yeah, our families were friends for a long time, a long, long time. And it's like, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool, man. That's the, my best catch ever right there. It's like, you know, like you said, I think there's never been a question about your girlfriend, never been a question about my wife. It's like she and I are supposed to be together. And I have no doubt about that. So and she's been supporting me a hundred percent. And you know, my fishing thing, it's just, I happen to be lucky enough to be a kid who grew up in Almorada and, uh, yeah, I love to go fishing and uh, love to take people fishing. And I was fortunate enough to win the gold cup and I'm going to win it again. I'm going to win you, it again. I know you are. I bet you are. I just started fishing again with a good friend of mine, Ned Johnson, who is the grandson of Carl Navre, who used to own the Chica, who flew the helicopter or whatever, but... His family and I have been intertwined for a long time. I've been fishing with him forever. And then, uh, yeah, we just started fishing again. So we lost a couple of really nice fish this year due to some crazy circumstances. But I don't doubt that uh, 2021, 2022. You got, you got your guy back. We'll be we'll be getting the trophy again. So, so you know, Craig, I just want to speak on behalf of, you know, the Florida Keys and the people who do and – and love what we do you are just so spectacular in every way i mean you are all about peace you are all about harmony you are all about brotherhood i'm a simpleton dude i i, would, I tell people i'm like the river i follow the path of least resistance you know i'm gonna go there and yeah i don't want to cause anybody a problem and it's it's uh, what else could you ask for dude i mean i get to be sitting here with you and this beautiful kid over here, and not a kid anymore. How old are you now? 26. 26. Oh, a kid still. <laughs> it's still good. No, but I got to say, like, I'm... Yeah, that's the coolest thing. I, I'm a pretty shy guy, and I, I I don't like to go up to many people and kind of bother them. But whenever I see you, it's like, I, I got to say hey. and You, you better. You, you fucking bring a smile to my face every time. So. Uh, I appreciate that, because, you know, yeah, you better. You better. I'm a pretty <laughs> shy guy, too, man. I don't know how I get all of a sudden put in front of these places where I got to be speaking and all the time. You know, I hate it. But because we like, love you. People ask me to read the rules all the time, you know. I'm <laughs> because we respect. Like, you know what? On, You're, dude. You are the most honest yeah. guy on the water be. with the, most, be, man. the greatest integrity. And you if, have, you, if you say something, it's, it's the truth. Sometimes. <laughs> no. Depends well, on how much rum you are. And you wear the most flamboyant <laughs> stuff. More more flamboyant than my father. And that's hard to do. <laughs> oh, no, fuck. Tell me about... It's tell getting me about, harder to tell do. Tell me about your shorts and all the all the, the, the colored flowers in your shorts. Uh, and, dude, and I ain't your, afraid. Attire. I ain't afraid, man. I ain't afraid. I ain't, I ain't afraid. I don't care. You know, I don't care. If, you, uh, if somebody wants to make fun of me, go ahead. I don't really give a shit. If somebody got a problem with me, uh, it's something that they've generated. Because I don't, I don't know. I probably did some people wrong a couple of times, but, you know, nothing. Nobody's you know, perfect. Come on. Yeah, it's like, I, you know, come on. So I don't really care. You know, I don't care. And uh, a lot of it is, too, the fact that, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm as big as I am. A lot of people don't mess with me just because. And then uh, I really... I don't know. It's pretty crazy because I live, uh, you know, I'm pretty grumpy a lot of times. You know, I don't let everybody know that, but. But some people know that. You're but a lot grumpy. of times, you know, it, uh, my reaction to things, something happens and I'll, ah, what the fuck, you know, bullshit, uh, bullshit, you know, uh, I'm gruff and I'm loud, but it's gone then. I don't, right. I don't harbor any of it. I don't keep any of it in. It's like, you no, know, unless somebody presses me on that. It's like, why do you got to act that way? It's like, why can't you say, hey. <laughs> I'm done with it. Don't press it. So no, but whatever. So you know, I, I don't know, man. I love everybody. So, you know, and I know, okay. Bottom line is, okay. I've had my heart broken. I've been embarrassed. I know how it feels and it sucks. And I don't want to do that to anybody. I don't want to put anybody in a position where they feel like, you know, oh, why is this guy doing this to me? It's like, you know, and, and trust me, if I ever do anything, uh, most of the time it's probably cause I've had too much alcohol. You know, if I ever do anything, you know, mean or something to somebody, I, but intentional, I'm never going to do that. And I'm always going to err on the side of caution. Right. You know, for whatever reason, I don't know. 
Um, but yeah, and I think fair is fair. And if it's like, like you know, if somebody's going to cheat, why you want to be there, you know? And if somebody's going to do this, so, you know, and I know people that do that. And it kills me because most of them are talented enough that they could just play by the rules and not do it. But other people, they just want to try to bend the rules and push the envelope and whatever. And it's all cool. But and I know some people, you know, when they're fishing in a tournament, they want to kick everybody's ass. They want to win. They want to win. They want to win. And if they don't win, they're not going to be happy. All right. I just want to compete. Because I know that you want to be in the game. I want to. I want to be in the game, but I want to compete. But I know that you know if I lose, it's going to be for whatever reason. It's something beyond my control. I can tell you that because I can tell you when you're fishing in a tarpon tournament, and I learned that a long time ago. It's like, dude, shit that doesn't happen on any other day of the fucking year, okay, is going to happen in the five days of the Gold Cup or the five days of the Holly. It's going to happen. You're going to see shit. You're going to see your perfectly tied huff nagel and everything else, you know, oh, he ate it so far down that he was rubbing on the top of the knot and the thing came untied after an hour and 45 minutes on a 180 pounder. But what are you going to do? You can cry about it or you can go, dude, put another leader on, cast out there again. Let's go go get another one. Get another one. So, and it's, you know, but. But but I think that but but I think that that's why you are so loved by everyone in the fact that you have this great passion for winning. You have this great DNA that we all appreciate, and you are the most loving, big-hearted person we all know. I appreciate that, and I have a passion for playing. I don't really have a passion for winning. I don't really care if I win or not. Okay, I don't. It doesn't really matter to me if I win. It's not going to change my life if I win. I've won. I've won the one You've I needed to lot. win, and my name's on the trophy. Okay, with your father's, with my father's name on there. Yes, and right behind yeah. that is my second favorite person with his son and his father's son too. So, and to Dustin, me, Dustin there's and nothing Steve. better than that. Dustin and Steve right behind me, fucking love it. Same angler, love it. You know, fuck it. And I love the relationship that those two guys have formed. And I got no animosity. I fished a lot of days with a dude, and now he's got a friend that he'll be friends with for the rest of his life. You know, and I, and and that's another thing that Steve uh, Steve Huff talks about a lot of times. He's become best friends with a lot of his anglers, okay, that have been lifelong friends. Um, unfortunately, in my scenario with my father, um, you know, my heart was broken at fourteen. At fourteen. So I put up a wall. You know, and everybody that gets on my boat, I'm going to have fun with you. I'm going to be your friend for a while, but I know that eventually you're going to be gone. All right. And I'm not going to cry about you. You, you learn that at, at a very I'm, young age. I'm sorry. I just can't do it. I just can't do it. I mean, I can't do it. I put the wall up and it's, it's there. And I could probably use some therapy on getting rid of that because it affects a lot of other relationships in my life. But at the same time, it's, you know, dude. When I see you, I'm going to love you like my brother. When I don't see you, I'm not going to reach out to you. I'm not going to call you, say, how you doing, what's going on, because I don't do that very often. It's like I tell Huff every time I go fish with him in September for a couple of days, and that's a whole other story I'll tell you about how that started. But it's like when I leave there, I go, dude, I don't do this with anybody else. Anybody else do I? I don't take. I don't have a friend that I go spend two days or three days fishing with anywhere. Nobody. I don't do that with anybody but him, and I've been doing it with him for – the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. But when Ron and I got married, he gave me uh, a fishing trip as a wedding gift. Okay. And like 15 years later, he called me up. He says, your trip is about to expire. You need to get your fucking, <laughs> you need to get your fucking ass over here. And I go, okay, when can I come? And he says, well, what's going on? How's your September look? And I go, well, my mom's turning whatever in September the 12th. So how about if I get a few days before and then go over there? Because she was in Sarasota and he's on the way. So he said, cool, let's do that. So we did it. And I went over there and I said, look, I want to fish with you for two days. I want to take you the day that you give me for a wedding gift. And then I want to fish another day and pay you for it. He says, all right. So he took Ron and I out fishing. It was storming, rainy. We got soaked. We had the best time ever. Stayed at his house with he and Patty. And It was know, the best time because you oh, were with him. Oh, fishing just, sucks. But just no, being fishing was still great. But it was, no, nah, but but yeah. him, yeah. And I, I spend time with him at the fly fishing school. I teach at the Outfitters, you know, Florida Keys Fly Fishing School. He's one of the instructors. I love spending time with him. So, And I've been friends with him for a long time for different reasons. But finally, I started fishing with him. He goes, hey, let's do this every year. I'm like, all right, let's do it. So, And every year, September, I get a couple of days. I drive over there, spend time with him. And I keep trying to get him to come here and fish with me because I know he loves to come down and go look at the old bonefish spots. But now he's got Dustin and the grandkids down in 
grassy. And I guess uh, last time I saw him, he was down here with uh, with his other son, Chad, who just turned 50. So he's bringing him down here to do a little fishing. So, but anyway, yeah, he's one of my favorite guys. Dude, so, and what and, what does Steve Huff mean to you? Uh, he's he's the guy, man. He's the guy. He is. He's uh. You know, he's not just uh he's not just a great angler, a great captain, great charter guy, great whatever. He's a great man. I mean, he's he's I don't even know how to explain what he is. Um It's like how do you define the Pope? It's not even the Pope, man. The Pope is driven by the Catholic religion. He's gotta uphold that stuff so he doesn't. Steve is not that guy. Steve is just a guy, you know. Steve is Steve is just like you. He's just like me. He's just like you, but he's a guy that works his butt off and he's always loved to fish and he does that. And he's the first guy on the water. He's the last guy. That's mean, <laughs> we go over, stay at his house. He says, we're up at six. We'll eat breakfast. We'll be on the water at eight. We go to Ted's put in. It's uh, we're getting back to the house at seven o'clock at night, you know, and he's pushing me around all day long. So, and it's not even that it's just, uh, I don't, I don't even know how you would, um, define steve jesus he's just a man's man you know and he's he's all about whatever you don't have there's no bullshit you know and there's no i'm this i'm that i'm you know whatever you know and he knows who i am i know who he is and when we're together it's like you know we're friends and i don't know friends are hard to come by true friends i'm I'm fortunate enough to have a piss load of them but at the same time, uh, I don't spend a lot of time with my friends. But it's pretty interesting here growing up, too. I knew the, you know, I don't hang out with anybody. You know, I hang out with my wife most of the time. I don't really have a lot of guys that I hang out with. But it's like if I needed 25 guys at my house tomorrow at 4 o'clock. They would be here. I'll make 30 phone calls. 25 guys will be here. Maybe 28 guys will be here. No, 40 would be here. Well, if I make that many calls, but. You, no, you, you make know, 30, 40 will be here. Yeah, we're but, all coming well and and yeah and you gotta love that man i mean it's you know so what else is there i don't really know and the fishing yeah the fishing's just secondary man i think it's hanging out with the people that have the passion and whatever and i have a passion for what you guys are doing though i'd love to be up in the mountains chasing elk and doing whatever my buddy rob's over just killed a big deer right you know whatever i'm looking forward to yeah getting out and shooting my bow here somewhere and dude you're always welcome to, somewhere you're always welcome in colorado well, well i appreciate that anytime. and dude i can't tell you how many people i have standing open invitations right now to hunt so many pieces of property um it's like last year i went to uh, i went to mississippi i fished with a guy a couple years ago named bobby cole and he just he had a little 400 acre lease that he has never let anybody outside of his family hunt and he let me hunt that property he took me on there the first day by my with he and i we sat in the ground blind and he goes you that deer's 42 yards away, and I stuck an arrow through it, and she, he goes, all right. And then I went on, and I killed a couple more deer on his property, but he saw me sighting in the gun. He says he was impressed with my with my skills as a, as a hunter, and he hunts all the time. And uh, he, I'm the only one outside of his family that he's ever let hunt his property, and he's still trying to get me to come back up and hunt there again. Ryan from uh, Yeti's invited me to come out and hunt his place. I got so many open invitations, but I just don't have the time. Yeah, I don't have the time. Yeah, um, everyone a, loves you. That's, that's a prime a example. To you, well, you know, sure. I love it. I just wish I had more time. So I'm a man of simple means, and uh, you know, I can't afford to do too many things. So, but I love it all. So, but it's fun, and it, it's you know, it's all good being around everybody that enjoys it. And that's you know, my most favorite thing about uh, fishing and stuff is the people I get to spend time with on occasion. You know, you, you, Sandy at the tournaments. You know, those guys, Hurstead. You know, a bunch of those guys that are there. I love seeing them all the time. Well, Flutie, we... he's a pain in my ass, but, you know, I've known <laughs> Flutie for a long time, and I love him, and I wish him well, and, yeah, it's all good. But, uh, well, shit, man. So, yeah, I don't know. So, But talk about fishing, you know. I do miss the bonefish, man. I cry about the bonefish. I cry about the tarpon a little bit, but it's all still good, so. And I don't know who's going to want to listen to this podcast because I'm not sure what we've talked about. But crying about this, crying about that. Everybody's going to love it. Dude, everyone loves you. But Craig. dude, my favorite, one of my favorite things was uh, getting to play adios with you guys. <laughs> you know, and I think that might have been the last time I hit balls. 
Well, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like in this private club that I'm a member of, we have this, the, you know, the range balls. They're all audios marked, yeah. tideless, <laughs> oh, OVX. You find a bunch of those in my bag or what? <laughs> I look over, here's Brewer pulling all these range balls into his bag. Range ball? <laughs> I said, Brew, take more. <laughs> I need to take more. Actually, R- Rhonda's dad, he's like, not, he'll be 92. 92 or 93, he used to have like a 12 handicap up until a few years ago, but that's how I really started playing golf. So he used to send me bags of balls that he'd find, pick up on the course, you know, while he's walking over looking for his in the woods, I guess. But uh, anyway, he sent me those balls. But I finally came to the conclusion that any ball that's been found off the course is going to end up off the course again because that's just how I hit him. But, <laughs> but no, I got a lot of respect for you guys. But I think it's really cool that, uh, you know, a lot of the guys who are into fishing, you know, especially fly fishing and sight casting, or whatever, and it's such a great sport, you know, golf. I say golf, at least when I know when I show up to the golf course, there's going to be 18 holes there. Right. I don't have to go looking for them. They're going to be there. So it's whether or not I can, you know, communicate my ball to get anywhere close to the hole. But with fishing... It's changed a lot. Um, you don't have 18 holes day. every day. You don't, but, uh, and there's a lot of other things that you can, you know, you got to deal with, but uh, I still love it. There's nothing like it, and I don't want to be doing anything else for, you know, for a living. But unfortunately, yeah, a lot of people, you ask me, when are you going to quit fishing? I say, well, when I fall off the back of the boat and I can't get back on, that's when I'll quit fishing. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's crazy. The sun's tearing me up too, so, but, uh you know, I love the fact that everybody, uh, you know, everybody wants to be part of this whole game. I'm just, I'm a little concerned about how how many people can future. can fit into it, you know, yeah. and not just that, but, you know, this used to be the sport fishing capital of the world, and now I think it might be like uh, the number one wedding destination and, uh, you know, a lot of other things, so. We got a lot of issues ahead of us, you know. The park is, you know, best fishing I've seen in a long time back there for snook and red fishing. But uh, I don't know about tarpon fishing coming back. A lot of little babies around this year. I've seen a lot of those. So there's, you know, there's definitely there's a lot of hope. There's hope for the future. So, yeah. and I still love doing what I'm doing. I want to get into more uh, instructional fishing, casting, and do stuff like that. I think uh, I want to stay involved with the Florida Keys Fly Fishing School and do that kind of stuff and maybe start doing some of my own stuff. In fact, before this COVID stuff hit, Ron and I were thinking about that, getting a motor home and start doing a little traveling. And that's what I was going to try to do, you know, incorporate some, uh, you know, fly casting seminars and some other stuff into our travels and things, which I thought would be real cool. And then, you know, COVID hit and we had to quarantine and it's like, well, where do I want to quarantine better right here in Nala Mirada? And it's right. so perfect but anyway that's uh you know a future something in the future maybe but you know i still love it i love the whole industry i love being a part of it i don't have any major sponsors so i'm not uh, beholden to anybody i'd love to get a couple more hardy rods if i could by chance there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but that was pretty cool too you know 2010 i still have one of the blanks that you gave me of your profiles the, 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 yeah the prototypes, your prototypes a which, prototype before we even had a, which, a, a product that we were commercially selling you guys won the gold cup i'm ready to get rewrapped and start using it again because that was uh, like a great rod which the other ones are still great too but it's like yeah I'll hardy send, wins gold cup i'll, I'll send perfect, you a new so. rod and reel but i tell you what i fished uh one of paul Terrace tournaments with uh dave preston he was throwing a little six weight hardy yeah at the snook i go really so he goes yeah i'll send you one so he sent me a little four piece six weight which i really like but what do you got in mid range, like eight, nine weights? You got anything in there? <laughs> Are you chumming? No, I'm just. Asking. Are you chumming? <laughs> I'm just asking. What's going on, Brew? Are you, what's your involvement Brew. with them still? Are you good with them still? Or what? I'm gonna send you anything you want. Oh man, you don't gotta do that. But uh, you know, hey, I love being part of the game, man. I love having my name mentioned in the rest of the guys that uh, you know I'm not deserving of it, but you no, know, you are I'm deserving really so much. Just here, man. But uh, yeah. but thank you, thank you for being you know the wonderful hey, man that you are. I do and what Thank I can, you for man. telling your story. Yeah, it's part of my story, and we need to do this again because we didn't touch on near uh, much stuff that. Uh, no, we could talk about, but anyway, I would like to mention a red bone. And if anybody's out there that, you know, can do anything and come help out, you know, cystic fibrosis is, uh, you know, the patients who have that now are doing very well on the new medications and stuff. And what Gary did for Gary CF Ellis is and Susan. Yes. And we're doing a tournament in a couple of weeks and it's going to be fun. November 20th through the 22nd. And 
Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with Redbone after this. Hopefully, we're going to get some new sponsorship and keep going, but I don't know to what capacity. But uh, we, I'd like to say thanks to everybody that's been involved and, and taking time out of their schedule to help support that because it is a big deal. And, uh, you know, we'll go on. And if there's, you know, anybody needs anything, if I can help them, just call me, man. I'd be happy to do whatever I can. If I can do it, I'll do it. If I can't, I won't. <laughs> You're that the best so bro cool, on man. the planet. Whatever, man. Whatever. It's all Thanks, awesome. Greg. Love you guys. Love, Love you, love guys. you man. Hey, welcome to my house. This might be the first time you've been here. Part it's part awesome. two. Part two. Coming soon. Hey, anytime. Anytime. Call me up. Appreciate it. Well, I saw it's best I'd stop.